Oh, okay. Counting the cost of being a physical therapist. Great. I, I didn't know she was going to be that exact. <laughs> she was ready to, ready to practice. But anyway. Okay, so <laughs> um, why did you decide to become a, a physical therapist? I originally wanted to become a psychologist. Um, I was more interested in why people did what they did. Um, and I did that for a few years, or well, a couple years, and then I was discouraged away from that because of all the years that you need to go to school for before you can actually become a psychologist, and some of the ideas and methodology behind it are a little questionable, so I started thinking of other options. Um, and my sister was the massage therapist at the time, and she gave me a really good massage one time, and she stretched me out really good. And I was like, I like this. You see results right away. And that's another reason why I like psychology kind of turned me off because it's a, it's a slow process. You have to oh. convince people to change their minds. Wow. And that's a long process. And I was very impatient. I knew I didn't have the patience for that. <laughs> but with stretching, it's like, you see results right away. Yeah. I like that. So I was thinking of going into phys uh, massage therapy because I also didn't like school. I didn't want to be so in school for so long, um, and this was a quick route. Um, but then, you know, my family said, you know, think about, you know, with massage therapists, it's hard to find work. You're not going to get very consistent work. You're not going to make a lot. It's, it's unpredictable. I was like, okay, what's the next step? And so my sister said, you know, physical therapists actually do more of the stretching thing that I did with you. So I was like, okay, we look into physical therapy. And that was a long road. That was four years of undergrad and three years of graduate school. You had to take chemistry and physics. And I was like, I'm not about to take all these things. I was not interested in taking all that science. So I was like, okay, let me become a physical therapy assistant. They have less time in school, not as much science based. Um, they don't just have, they just don't have so much schooling. And then my family encouraged me again. My mom said, well, oh, Janet, just, just be the physical therapist. You know, you don't want to, you know, go higher, basically. And I was like, I was pretty resistant initially because that's still a lot of schooling. And I'm the one who's going to go through that. You know, no one else is going to go through that. I'm going to go through that. Um, but as I started, you know, researching it more, thinking about it, realizing, you know what, I don't want to end up going back to school later. I just want to, like, be done. Like, go for it, goes to the top. There's no turning back. I don't want to be PTA. And three years later, it's like, you know, I wish I, I want to be the PT. And then go back to school. I was like, no, let's get this all over with. Um, and then one of our church members, he was a physical therapist, and he did, like, a mission report in church one day. And the way he presented it, it was like, you know, you can – he went on a mission trip without like his physical therapy hat on, he wasn't going as a physical therapist, but then he went and helped somebody learn how to walk with their prosthetic. You know, he just had the skill available. And I was like, you know, I really like how versatile this is. Like you can go anywhere and just help people. You're not dependent on medications. You know, like if you're a physician, like you, you're dependent on a lot of things where you can really help people with PT. You just help them right there on the spot. You just kind of fix how they move, give them stretches, adjust things physically, things that like empower the patient to do what they need to do. Mm. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this. So all these things kind of came together to make me decide I'm going to be a physical therapist. So that's what started me on my Wow. Journey. It sounds like a perfect comprehensive answer to any physical therapist interview sort of thing. <laughs> so have you had more than one? <laughs> so wow, it was awesome. So initially you wanted to become a psychologist. And then, okay, so, and your sister and your mom and the physical therapist that went on a mission trip influenced your decision to become a physical therapist and go through all the educational training that you have to go through. And then, sounds like you are done with the training? Yes. Oh. <laughs> there was an end to it. I finally graduated and became a physical when therapist. When was that? Huh? When was that? Um, 2018. 2018. Oh, 2018. it's been two years. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, uh, uh, so I, have, I got some questions as I was listening to you. So, uh, what did you not feel comfortable about being trained as a psychologist? 
Um, okay, I'm trying to think about what was the weightiest matter. Um, one of it was, you know, like I mentioned, it takes a long time to like process things with people. And I know I get, like, especially more so than I get, uh, I would get upset if people didn't take my advice. Like, like you're counseling people, like you're dealing with a lot of, you know, mindsets that are hard to change. And I was like, I get upset when people don't take my advice. And so I would just get really, I know I'm going to get impatient with these people. So I don't think this is going to be healthy for me in the long run. I'm not going to be happy. I'm just going to get frustrated with people. Oh, I see. And also just, you know, there's so many theories out there about, you know, how the mind works and different ways to approach that. And some of it, like, because coming from a Christian background, I wasn't sure if I could stand behind all the theories and different methodologies of working with people like hypnosis or like other certain um, methodologies. Um, so I just decided to avoid it altogether. But I think the number one thing was like I knew I was impatient and I didn't want to sit with somebody and try and convince them that they didn't want to take my advice. <laughs> so I guess it didn't really go well with their personality. And then also, the methodology that we're using is pretty much against your worldview, probably yeah. coming from a Christian worldview. And you said that, like, they, they, I think they use hypnotizing people or something, right? What's wrong with that? Oh, it's just, for my Christian background, ultimately, I, I know that at the foundation of all problems, really, and many problems, is a spiritual root. And certain, if you're in a secular environment, most psychology approaches take out the God aspect. And for better or for worse, like if I can't bring that in in certain aspects, in certain ways, like I don't feel like I'm giving my client, I would be giving my clients the best service because I'm leaving out such a big component of psychology, like your spiritual aspect. You know, whether you're a Christian or Buddhist or whatever, your religious background is like uh, some connection to a higher power needs to be acknowledged. And that's not usually acknowledged in traditional psychology or in a way that's very um, non-definitive, very flexible depending on, you know, your background. So I knew I had more distinctive views oh, I and I probably would have been able to put that into action if I was a traditional psychologist. Okay. So do you think is, it is possible to study all that and then not use those elements? Or do you think it's just too much influence that you could handle, that you have to go through? Um, back then, I didn't even think that far into it. <laughs> oh, I see. I was just, you know, the trying thing. to find a career that I enjoyed and that I liked. But okay. Now, from my perspective, like, thinking about that question, like, I think it's possible, okay. you know, like, if you're, if you're really committed to, like, a certain thing, like, it doesn't matter what influences are around you, yes, you're just going to have to be more, more intentional about who you want to be, yeah. and then you can, um, you don't have to let those influences affect you, but you have to have a very strong vision coming into that, otherwise, it can be too much for, for somebody. Yeah, I think the, the biggest conflict is if you are hypnotizing somebody, they are being possessed by a different kind of, it could be evil, bad spirit, or very powerful, demonic, something bad coming into you, and then they may lose their sense of, of identity, and, and you are talking about the spiritual, supernatural, good kind of power coming in to your mind so you can be empowered by the extra help that you can get. So I guess there is a big conflict as to are you going to maintain your identity, individuality, freedom of choice, or are you going to be empowered by a different uh, divine power available to you? So I guess it's very different approaches. So, um, because I can totally relate to you because when I was an English major, I felt like I was reading a bunch of garbage and I didn't want, I didn't agree with a lot of authors. Um, perspectives and I didn't want to read all of them but I had to write all of read all of them to write paper on it so I can totally agree relate to you in that aspect so um so how long is the training uh, respectively 
the physical therapist, assistant, physical therapist, massage therapist, how are they different in terms of the lengths of the training? Yeah, um, sorry, before I continue, I need sure. to get a hug. Sure, sure, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. 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 Otherwise, we're gonna drop. Thank you. All the battery. Yeah. All right. I need to do, like get it charging. Sure. All right, we're good. Yeah, that's fine. Um. So for a massage therapist, it can range anywhere from six months, from six months to eighteen months, and you just go into like a certif certification program. Um, depending on like uh, what program you go into, the months can vary, but it can be anywhere from six to eighteen months. Um, and you don't need any prerequisites; you just kind of show up, <laughs> and they train you from the bottom up. Um, physical therapy assistants—they have to do some a little bit of undergrad. They have to do prereqs. They don't need to get a degree beforehand, but they need to do some prereqs, and then they go into a PTA program. Um, and that's typically about two years or 18 months. Oh, wow. Well, therapy, for a physical therapist, you have to get your bachelor's in something. Um, and you also can finish up your science requirements. And then you have a three year um, graduate program. Oh. So seven years total. Oh, I see. So massage therapist and physical therapist assistant is about less than two years. and. You can just get it done without any required like requirements and then physical therapist you need to get a degree or bachelor's in any area and then you just go to the physical therapist um like graduate yeah well PTA, graduate. ptas they need to get some yeah. like undergrad like some free recs and okay. then enter okay. their two-year program so it can be like maybe three or four years total with all their free recs plus their program but with physical therapy, you have to do your four years of undergrad, you know, get your get your prereqs and a degree, and then get into ah, the program. Ah, okay, okay. So there are some classes you need to take, and then you get a bachelor's, and then go into the graduate school. Yeah. Oh, I see. So was it something that you expected? Uh, because you thought initially it was just too long, and how did you enjoy doing all that seven years or eight years? And then it went by. <laughs> I, I felt like, well, my undergrad years were good. They were hard. You know, certain classes were just really hard and I just had to do it. Um, I had a lot of good experiences though in undergrad. You know, I enjoyed my, I enjoyed my general classes. I enjoyed being in school, but relatively. Of course, you know, as a student, you're always complaining about something when you know, you're busy, you're tired or whatnot, but I had a good overall like undergrad experience, um, and like once I put my mind to something, or once I like set, once something is established, like okay, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be a physical therapist. I'm gonna go down this road. It's just like here we go. We're, we're doing it. <laughs> you know, there's oh, no. Yeah. yeah. Gonna, um, and then in physical therapy school, like those three years were some were great years. Oh really? Like, the program itself was tough, but so I went to Loma Linda. It's a it's a medical a medical college of sort of medical university. It's an associated it's an association with the hospital. So they have medical school, they have nursing school, they have all it's a healthcare professional postgraduate school. So compared to medical students who we would see, you know, on a regular basis, PT school was easy. <laughs> <laughs> So we had time to have fun on the weekends. We had weekends. Medical school students didn't. Um, if you if you meet physical therapists, they're some of the most fun people out there. Okay. So if you want to just hang out with someone fun and have a good time, yeah. hang out with a physical therapist. Like we know how to have a good time. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, we. I had a great time in in, in grad school. Like, um, made a lot of friends at school and at church. My sister dormed with me, so we just, we had a great time hanging out with friends, studying, you know, and going to school, but I feel like I had a really good, um, I had a broad experience. It wasn't just academic. I had a good social life as well. Like it was balanced in that sense. Wow. So I had a great time, you know, there was, there were hard days. There were, you know, 
tough things, tough tests, but it's just like, okay, we just go to the next test. <laughs> you know, we get through this somehow. Wow. Um, so you but it was great. So you, re you really enjoyed your, your, your undergrad and graduate school days, and then you did study hard, and you did socialize, and you, you, you went through it, and then, um, so was there a time when you thought uh, some of the things that you had to go through wasn't really practical or necessary when you were, because you're already working as a physical therapist? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's always things that are not very essential to your program. I think any, any major, yeah. there's going to be, that you're like, why am I learning this? I'm not going to use it. Yeah. And you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, it's another thing that builds character in a different way. It's, it's, it's making you, you're learning life things, <laughs> life lessons of just getting through uh -huh. something that you don't like uh -huh. and that's building your character to be a better person yeah yeah you know, not just in your career but like okay i'm just learning to do hard things and be okay with that mm, i see um but yeah there are some some things like pathology okay. didn't really not really using that now <laughs> pathology isn't that about disease or something yeah but like the way it was, it was going to the cellular level it's like we're never going to be using that in, ah. in oh, but see. you know it just it broadens your mind it makes you like i appreciate i appreciate you know everything that we went through of course i don't think it was as, some things were as useful as others but i mean okay. taking a step back like even in undergrad you know like that's why you have generals that's why you take classes that are completely unrelated to your major because it broadens your mind you're not so stuck in one view like you're not just stuck in your own major you have to realize there are other things in this world besides your own major. Uh -huh. So we take history, uh -huh. even if you're a science major, you know? Yeah. So like in, in grad school, same thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, um, so didn't you feel like some of the things that you learned in, in your undergrad years were just being regurgitated, you're just doing the same thing over and over, or did you just learn anything different at a substantial level, the graduate stuff? What do you mean? Like, like. So when you are doing your undergrad, um, you are not a physical therapy major at the time, right? Or were you studying specifically about physical therapy? I was a kinesiology major, and so that's the study of movement, like movement in the body. So it's, it prepares you for okay. physical therapy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, it's not, it's not exactly the same thing. Not exactly, but it's like the, the foundations, like preparatory. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, the, the, the reason why I asked that question was because, you know, like theology students, they go through the undergrad training. And some of them said that, oh, they're doing exactly the same thing that we already did for four years when they go to the seminary. Oh, I see what you're saying. So I was wondering if something like that happened, but when I thought about what you already mentioned, it's not, the name of the program wasn't even a physical therapy major. Mm -hmm. So what was the major well, again? Kinesiology. Kinesiology. Yeah, kinesiology. It's... The study of, of movement, movement in the body. Oh, I see. Muscles, the study of muscles and movement in the body. Okay. Um, but there were things that, that I learned. Yeah, some things, you know, like foundational stuff you hear again. Mm -hmm. But, like, it's always good to hear it again and again and again and again. And then yeah, in grad yeah. school, they take it to the next level. Like, they show you even more principles behind it. They show you how to actually apply it. Like, okay, we're going to do these exercises now, and now we're going to apply all those principles to that. Uh, and we're going to answer questions. We're going to, like, learn about different conditions and how to apply those principles that you've learned to these conditions. Uh, um, and there, in fact, there was, if anything, like, I'm really grateful for my undergrad. Like... I really did have a good undergrad program that prepared me for grad school because there were certain aspects, 
sort of things that I learned in undergrad that I felt were taught better in undergrad than in PT school. Yeah. I was like, wow, I'm so glad I had that class because if I had just been going off of what I learned in PT school, I would have been missing some things. Yeah. You know, it's just like the nature of like different programs, different people teaching, different learning styles, you know, so... I'm grateful for my undergrad experience and my graduate experience. I feel like they were, they just went hand in hand, like they were complimentary. Wow, that's great. So, yeah. so, so which which uh, school did you go to for the first one? For undergraduate, I went to Sierra College. I went to a community college for three and a half years. Okay. Because I took it even slower. Um, and then I went to Sacramento State University, so a public university for two years. Oh, so okay. I was in undergrad for almost six years. <laughs> yeah, almost six years, dang! And then like I had PT school on top of it, so like nine years, really. Oh, that's so long. That was in, oh my word! Just saying this out loud right now is crazy. Like I was in school for almost ten years, like nine and a half years before. Oh, that's almost like a doctor status. <laughs> well, I mean, technically, like in the state. It's a DPT now, so doctor at the physical therapy. So there is a doctor behind my name. We don't, physical okay. therapists, we're not big about like touting titles, but like it's there. Yeah. But uh, honestly, it didn't feel like 10 years. Oh. I mean, it felt like I was in school forever. Yeah. But I didn't, in terms, I didn't think of it in terms of like year one, year two, year three, year four. Wow, no? that's, that's unbelievable. Yeah. So was it that long? Because you wanted to learn more things, or is that typically how long it takes? Um, I think I just, I didn't cram myself as much. Like, I would just take, because, you know, you have, like, a, the, a full-time load is, like, 12 credits per semester. Yeah. Um, and I would only take, like, maybe 14 credits per semester in, in undergrad. Uh, I know there were people who were like crazy who wanted to like get 16, 17, 18 credits per semester to get out faster. Oh. For me, I was like, no, I don't want to push myself like that because I want to get decent grades. So, and I had the, um, thankfully, I had financial aid that would cover me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, there's no pressure financially to get things done sooner or, yeah, I, I could have, I could afford not like I was wow. rich now, rich, but like I was, I had the opportunity to take my time and wow. not be pressured to like finish up really soon. Wow. So I took that and I was like, you know, let me let me enjoy this. Let me enjoy taking my classes because I didn't like want to learn and explore other things. Because remember, I didn't want to take all those science classes. That's what like was a big turn off initially. So I was like, I want to like, take other things, like do some psychology classes. <laughs> <laughs> I took I took extra time. Okay, so you did take your time. I did. I see. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> so, do you think those experiences are helping you now, or do you feel like you wasted time? Yeah, I don't regret it at all. Like how I how I planned out my undergrad, the things I did, like the classes I took when I did, how many I did. Like, I don't regret it at all. Actually, that's a very good approach because when I was taking classes in school, starting from university, I didn't take classes just to graduate. I, I was studying to learn, to apply, right. to use it, and it's helping me now. And all these people that were just cramming into their, their mind for no reason, other than just getting good grades, their English is, is not as great. So I think whatever you were doing at the time was becoming a good asset or foundation for, for your work now. Yeah. Or for your life in general. Mm-hmm. So, um, do you, do you see there is any connection between how people uh, treat their mind? Um, because you said that when you were dealing with their bodies, um, you can really open up their hearts and you can really come in contact with them. Um, in a way, maybe psychologists or psychiatrists may not be able to get because they're just talking, but you're actually massaging them and helping with their pain and everything. So, um, is there any psychological element that you put into when you uh, work as a physical therapist? Do you also get to work with their minds? 
and the way you treat them. Definitely. Um, and actually, this is another reason why I went into PT that helped me make that switch over because I realized, you know, psychology apply is can be applied to any aspect of life. That's just like how the mind works. Psychology is a study of the mind. Um, and when I'm working with people, like there are certain people who won't come to psychologists because of stigma um, or counseling because of, you know, it has a bad reputation or connotation and they don't want to be seen as that person who goes to a psychologist, but they have to go to a doctor and they have to go to a physical therapist. They have to like get their medical needs taken care of. Um, and I'll be working with them and dealing with their minds. So it's like, I'll get a two for one. I can do psychology and something else. Whereas if I was in psychology, I would just be limited to that field mm -hmm. and whoever's brave enough to come to a psychologist. So I was like, you know what? I love me a good deal. So if I do physical therapy, I can do PT and psychology. Like I get one plus one. So that was, <laughs> that was my mindset when I was in college. And, and now it definitely goes hand in hand when I'm working with patients and people are very, they're in a very vulnerable state. They're in a broken state. And many times they're very frustrated. They're at the end of their rope. Like I've been to all these, I've tried to help. I've been to all these people who tried to help me with my pain and it hasn't worked and I need help. And you just need to help them psychologically get through that. Um, you know, give them comfort, just walk beside them and let them know, Hey, you know, we're here to help you. You're going to get through this. Um, you just, you're providing companionship for people in a very hard time. And for physical therapists, we spend the most time one on one, one of the, or one of the, um, healthcare professionals who spend the most time with their patients and actually physically in contact with them. It's doctors that just see their patient. They don't even always physically examine them. Or if they do, it's a very quick physical examination. We're very much in contact with the patient as we like do exercises, as we do manipulations and some type of massage with them. Like we see a lot of things that the doctors miss. And so we have the opportunity to connect with them in a way that the doctors don't. Um, so definitely people will open up to you or start talking about whatever situations they're going through while you're working on them. Um, they feel, sometimes they feel it's a safe place um, for them to vent these things out that they're going through. And so when you under, also, when you have a difficult patient, <laughs> you, know, you have to understand where they're coming from. Like these people are in pain. And these people have had many hard experiences that have been, that have shaped them into this, into why they're this angry person. And you have to have enough um, perspective to remember that and yet treat them kindly and not explode back at them. So psychology like really does, it really is integrated into physical therapy. Like if you want to be a good physical therapist, you have to understand how the mind works, why people do what they do. Um, in order to to connect with people um, and actually really help them. Because if you don't, then it's a miserable 40 minutes that you're stuck with that patient. You know, you're not like a doctor. You see, you know, five minutes in and out and you're gone. Or I'm not, like some doctors spend a little bit more time. But, you know, you're, you're with that patient for a while. So you better learn how to communicate well with them and get along for your sake and their sake. Wow. So it sounds like if you're a horrible uh, people skill person, you're not going to enjoy being a physical therapist because you're stuck with the person for so long. And have you ever seen any examples of those people or those people that are just thoroughly enjoying their work as if they're just, just, I don't know, they're just having a good time? Or how do you perceive yourself to be in that aspect? I really love my career. I love my job. Oh, that's great. Um, I, you know, when you mentioned that, I was like, oh, yeah, I've seen one. <laughs> 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 but, you know, reality is sometimes you you don't always love your job. Yeah. Um, that's because you've, at least for me anyways, because I've kind of lost my vision and purpose in life, and that's when I'm not fulfilled and satisfied in my job. Because for me, 
like I get more satisfaction from my work when I am working for my patients and I'm not occupied with myself. How well am I doing as a therapist? How well am I doing? What am I being perceived as? Like when all of that noise is out and I focus purely on the patient and how can I work for them and serve them and not even serve them, but like, how can I be a team member? How can we work through this together? How can I be a part in making their life better? Or be a part of their story that's when my satisfaction goes through the roof um and i thoroughly enjoy my career and i have seen people other people like that and i've been inspired by people who do that i'm very privileged to have actually experienced that because i know not everyone else has well wow, that's a really um, yeah go ahead yeah so job satisfaction yes um I'm highly satisfied in my job when I keep perspective. Otherwise, when I lose perspective, then it becomes a job. And I'm just doing it because this is my job. And, you know, like there, there are aspects for sure that like my strengths, my natural inclinations come out. Like I had mentioned, you see results pretty fast. Yeah. And I do, I do my job for those reasons because yeah. of, you know, I just like, you know, to see results. Yeah. I like to do one plus one equals two, and I'm going to do this with you, and we're going to get results, and boom, there we go. Yeah. It's not disassociated from the actual person behind that. Yeah. Um, but I put the person in the process, and I am willing to go through a process, because before I remember I didn't want to go through psychology because of all the processing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're a physical, you have to process with your patients. You have to be patient while they go through their process. And there's a lot of patients who are impatient with their process. Uh, like they want to get better really quick and they're frustrated that therapy's not working fast enough. Uh, and you have to walk them through and like let them know, hey, you know, it's it's gonna be a while, but like, hey, see how you've improved, see where you were before, and you put on your psychologist hat and you walk them through uh, their you're going through and give them perspective uh, and let them know, hey. Nothing in life that is good comes fast, typically. You wow. gotta put the work and do it. And you just have to be sympathetic and understand, you know, where they're coming from and acknowledge that, like, hey, it's hard, I know it's hard, but you know, one step at a time. You have to give your body time to work through this. And you have to anyways, you have to educate your patient a lot. So wow. You know, I ran away from psychology initially because of all the time it takes to work with some, a person through yeah. a process. Yeah. And here I am doing that with my patients. Wow. Um, and when I don't, when I try and skirt that and just try and be super cut and dry, like it's not satisfying. And mm. I'm not satisfied with it. My patient's not satisfied with it. But since unfortunately life is so, we're so used to seeing that, not, we're not used to seeing people living out wholeheartedly, pursuing things wholeheartedly, being willing to go through a process, enjoy it, or at least learn to enjoy it, and not complain through it. It's it's so strange. We don't know how to work with that. We don't know what to do with that. So we just revert to, okay, let's just get through this. So, and this is a long, I feel like I'm talking a lot. <laughs> no, you're supposed to talk. <laughs> What? I said you're supposed to talk anyway. Okay, well, I guess I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, job satisfaction is there. Wow, you said a lot of significant things. So, when you get the self out of the way, when you are focused on helping that person grow, not just in physical healing, but also um, being able to cope with the stress, frustration Get so pretty much yeah in helping with their help in helping with uh, them maintaining positive healthy um, constructive perspectives and also um uh, your dream in wanting to become a physical i mean the psychologist came true in the form of physical therapist because you're dealing with their mind so um do you remember any specific patient that you encountered in during your uh, training as a student or recently as a physical therapist that uh, still lingers in your mind because it was such a memorable experience? Mm. 
I have so many like bits and pieces, like okay. encounter with this person, like this moment, and this encounter with this person, another moment. Um, I guess. Uh, so recently, had a patient. This guy is really impatient with his process. Yeah. I mean, and it's understandably so. Yeah. Like he had several surgeries that went bad in his neck and his back, and he was wheelchair bound. Wow. You know, this was like a, a regular strong guy, and then his surgeries just failed him, and he ended up being stuck in a wheelchair. That's even more tough. Like if you had a regular life, and then you just become wheelchair bound, it's really it really messes you up psychologically too. Um. So he's been in our clinic for over a year, and we've seen him from being in a wheelchair to now he's walking in a walker, like, you know, like a walker with wheels on it. And sometimes he can walk without any support. It's shaky, but he's walking. Wow. And so this guy, I mean, recently I've been working with him lately, and he's always complaining about, I never knew it was going to take this long of a time. Like, it's so slow. He keeps emphasizing that. I'm like, Remember how far you've come. You know, a, week, a year ago, and to be honest, I didn't even think he was going to walk again. But he's walking, you wow. know? I had to encourage him in that, like, I, he's one patient that I always have to, like, reshift his perspective. Um, but uh, something really memorable with this, with this guy was just a, a couple sessions ago, I was working with him, and he was really off balance, and he actually almost fell. Thank God, no, none of my patients have fallen on me. Um, but he was like, you know, my feet, I feel like my feet are in eggshells. He's been saying that for a long time. And it's like, you know what? I'm going to look at his feet now because we've been look, looking at like globally everything else. So took off his shoes and socks, like super ashy, like, you know, the type when you take off the socks, all the flakes of skin. <laughs> <come on. laughs> And it's like, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, this this is life, you know, this is what you have to do. But it just goes to show this guy has not taken care of his feet. Also, he can't really bend down and take good care of it anyways. So anyways, we took it off. I was looking at his toes and then I was moving his toes and they were literally snapping as I was straightening them out. Like the joints were so stiff, like cracking as I'm loosening of all of his toes. And he was like, Wow. No one has ever looked at my feet up until today. Wow. You know, and it's like, I always knew something was wrong with my feet. <laughs> and it's like, now we're finally addressing it. So, worked on his feet. You know, I, I put him up on a table later. I actually wiped down his feet with a wet washcloth, trying to like take off some of the, the dead skin because, you know, he can't physically do that very well. Um, and just took care of his feet. And addressed it. And I took a lot of time with that patient. Um, but stuff like that is what's satisfying because when you see, when you do above and beyond, when you do more than the bare minimum, that's really, for me, that's where all the satisfaction comes from. Because wow. I know I'm not doing it just for a job. Like, I'm doing this because I, I want to be invested in this person. Mm. You know, this person needs this. We get better. So, of course, I'm going to do that. It's not like, there's no second guessing. It's not like, I, I need to get through this patient quickly, and, you know, move on to the next. And thank God I actually had time to do that. But even if I didn't, like, I just have to rearrange my future schedule with other patients, you know, to, like, make sure this guy gets taken care of. So that was a memorable experience of, like, working for my patient. Um, and the next day he came back. Or the next session came back, it's like, my feet feel so good. Oh, really? I'm able to walk here. I know, like, I can feel the ground underneath underneath me now. Because before his feet were so stiff, there was no sh no shock absorption. So now his feet are more flexible. So when he walks, there's more shock absorption. He's more balanced. And he's like, I'm glad we finally addressed this. And even then, like, you still have to keep perspective. Like, you know what? It wasn't a disservice, like... We weren't holding out on you necessarily by not addressing your feet right away because there are other bigger things like globally that we had addressed before we could even really like start getting down to the nitty gritty of your feet. You know, so even that is like you're still leaving in perspective 
um, all along. Wow. So that was a neat experience. And there was another, another time with a patient. This is over. This is over a year ago. Um, I walk into the lobby, and I see this guy. You know, I say, I said good morning to him. Good morning. I went in, you know, to, to the office area. And then later on, he was actually my patient. He was his first time visit, his initial evaluation. We count, I come in to work with him, and we have a referral. It's for his right knee, but really it's his left knee that's the problem. And it's like, okay, how are we going to work with this? Because you need to be seen. You need to get care, but it's going to take forever if you go back to get another referral before you come back to therapy, you know? And so I was just problem solving with this guy. And it's like, you know what? We'll see you for this right knee, even though it's your left that's a problem. But you know what we do for the right? You can also do for your left at your home. We just can't legally work on that, but I'll give you exercises so you can kind of help yourself at home until we get the new referral. So just problem solving with that patient. And he was like, you is a people person, you know? And it was just so nice that we worked together as a team through that. And we enjoyed ourselves. And it wasn't like client professional it was like we were working on this together like we were a team like I was fighting for him and he knew that and so he had buy-in and it's not I even hate using that word like buy-in because it's like I'm trying to manipulate something it's like no like he decided to participate in this journey too because I gave the invitation like I was open he was open and we just you know did life together okay like how are we gonna how are we gonna solve this <laughs> so I really love that at that um, camaraderie, uh, integration, like we're weaving, I'm just, I'm weaving a part of myself into his story. Wow. And I love that. I get the opportunity to do that with so many patients every day. And you know, not everyone, every, not everyone is as dramatic or um, large scale as others, uh -huh. but there's still, you're still like a, a drop in the bucket. And that's satisfying. Actually, I've never heard that word, teaming up with a patient in pursuing the ultimate healing um, as a medical professional, from a medical professional, because that's something unheard of, um, personally, and in the previous interview that I had with a UK uh, doctor that is still doing her residency, um, it really dawned on me because... I don't remember having meaningful uh, interaction with nurses or doctors or physical therapists um, in the way that you, you did, like taking extra mile, fighting for you, even though you're not, uh, you, don't, you, don't, you didn't have to do those things because there was a legal limitation, you still went ahead to help that patient um, with the things that the, the patient really needed at that moment because it would be too complicated for him to go back and forth with the referral and, and everything. So, how did you gain that perspective, teaming up with the patient in the process of healing? It, it was a long process for myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I went through a really dark time um, about a, almost two years ago, about when I started my job. When I started my job, I was going through a really dark time personally in my life. Um, I felt like I was such a failure in so many areas. I was very broken in many personal areas. And I had a friend who sat with me through several months of just depression, anxiety, just my thoughts were going crazy. I had no peace. I, I didn't have a solid foundation of who I was, didn't have a solid foundation of who God was. And I was raised in a Christian home, but yet that certain aspects were not truly tested and foundational in my own life. So I went through this personal crisis that really shook me at my foundation and my core. And I had a friend who sat with me through all of that. Wow. And she taught me about process. Wow. She was like, Kendra, you are a one, two, three person, black and white, but that's not life. And that's where all of my foundational problems in life were stemming from because I didn't want to go through a process. I just wanted simple solutions. One, two, three, black and white. There's no, there's no interplay 
There's no room for dialogue or discussion or uncertainty. I had a very hard time dealing with all of those things. Mm. So she sat with me and we did life together. Wow. And she really changed my perspective on people and God. Wow. Because your view of people is going to be from the view of God. Yeah. And through that, slowly, like, I just started to appreciate people and not be so self-absorbed. Wow. Um, learn to, I remember, like, the first day at my, at work, where I actually loved my patients. Wow. Where, like, it was a clean slate in my mind. I didn't have any noise about myself. And I was just so focused on my patient, like, how am I serving them? How am I wow. giving them their best wow. interest? Wow. And for me, like, that was, that day, I couldn't even believe what was happening. I was like, this was only a dream for me to ever be like this. Wow. I didn't even, like, maybe not even a dream, but, like, it wasn't even, like, something in my mind. And some, my mind didn't even conceive that that was possible for me to be like that. Wow. And that was just one day. I was like, wow, I've tasted something. And you know, the next few days, like, it was a glimpse, it was a taste, but I never forgot that. And then my sister went through a health crisis herself. And she, so many people went above and beyond what was, what would be expected. Mm. You know, what would be the bare minimum. They went above and beyond for my sister. Wow. And I was like, people, people do that. Wow. You know, so many models of people go above and beyond wow. for some reasons. Wow. That was like, I'm going to, I, I want to be like that. Wow. So it, some of it's not even conscious, but you're, when you surround yourself by good models, yeah. and that's the importance of modeling, we need to see wow. examples as it's possible. Wow. So through all of that, that just slowly started like integrating into my own life, into my own personal life, my professional life. Yeah. And I saw it more so in my professional life because, well, at least in terms of healthcare, because I hadn't seen many people model that. And combined with, you know, my own personal experience about like going through a process, having somebody go through a process with me, finding pleasure in a process, wow. excitement in relational aspects, wow. and not two, two, three, black and white. Like, I carried that into my, my workplace. And, it's, yeah, wow. I know the difference. And, like, there was another, after all that, there was another period in my life where, like, I, I turned away from all of that. I was, I got really disillusioned by a few things, and that just, my life crashed. And so I turned away from that, from relational, living relationally, going through a process, being willing to grow. Um, yeah, I shut down in a lot of ways. And so then I started reverting to like old ways of relating to people and my patients. And I, I could see the difference in my workplace. Mm -hmm. um, but thank God, I like to a series of events, you know, I'm, I'm coming back to that. Wow. And so I've been on both ends of the spectrum and I know even even now, I'm going through a process to get back to that full stage, that stage of more full satisfaction, more full giving of myself for patience. And not even viewing it as giving of myself, it's like I'm teaming up with you. Wow. You know, that's so much more exciting. And it takes the pressure off you because, like, when we think about serving other people, am I serving them? Am I, am I serving them? You know, like, yeah, yeah. you're still thinking about yourself. Like, yeah. when you're out of the picture yeah. and you're clean, yeah. you don't have any other noise, yeah. you're just focused on, like, how are we going to do this? Wow. And it's a process. Wow. And you can be excited about doing it together. So, I don't even remember the original question. <laughs> wow. I'll, 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 experiences I'll, with patients. Man, and then how did you yeah. get that perspective? Yeah. Man, I was so blown, blown away by all the things that you have just mentioned because you, you went through your personal identity crisis and there was a friend that built you up as she was walking you through the process relationally. Um, and then that uh, inner healing 
uh, built you up for your uh, professional uh, aspect as you're reaching out to other people because you have that inner healing that already happened. You became solid and now you're able to reach out to other people from the same healed mind and you are still taking that steps to continue that journey. And I was so, it, it, like everything that you said, it sounded like atomic bomb. Like it just so, it was so powerful. The fact that you became a victim, um, you became vulnerable, became weak, and then somebody came along and somebody helped you stand up on your feet. And now you're helping somebody walk spiritually, physically, mentally, socially, relationally in every way possible. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen the job of working as a physical therapist this meaningful. <laughs> and it's it's not just limited to physical therapy because if you have these principles, you can apply it to anything, any career that you're in. That's true. It's a perspective on life. Yeah. Because we we become so not even one dimensional, but we just focus on one area of life. Like I want to get, I want to be better at my job. Yeah. And you don't even think about how to be better with your family, your friends, yeah, your yeah, 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 yeah. other areas. Yeah. And like, if you want to be, if you want true growth, you want true satisfaction and fulfillment in life. Yeah. You you have to be symmetrical in your growth. Like you yeah. have to be willing to not just grow in your job, but be willing to grow at home. Mm. Be willing to grow, you know, socially. Like where everywhere else. You can't just pick and choose the areas yeah. you want to grow. Yeah. Because if you do, you're you're not gonna grow well. Wow. <laughs> you're just gonna be stunted or you're gonna be grow in a more deformed way. Yeah. It's not gonna be it's not gonna be solid. Wow. You have to grow in a balanced manner in every way, in every way, not in, not in, just, in just one way. If you look at a plant or a tree, like, yeah. they grow symmetrically. Yeah. Like, if you notice, like, something is more prominent in yeah. one area than the other, you yeah. feel like something's wrong with that. Yeah, like, yeah, what happened? True. Yeah. You know, true. and the same thing with people, but we just don't, we don't translate that over. We don't see it that way. Yeah. You know, like, oh, I'm just developing my strengths. Yeah. What about your other weak areas? If you're not developing those two, yeah. your growth is not going to be symmetrical. Your strengths are going to be too overpowering. Yeah. And then you're just going to self-sabotage. So. Wow. That's a, that's a really, really solid perspective. So when you said your friend was trying to help you establish in your, in your identity, you, you said the word black and white. Was your friend telling you that stop being so black and white? Or was your friend saying that this is bad and this is good. Please get this straight. Oh, like, was she being black and white in her way of telling me that I was black and white? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I was wondering if, if black and white was something positive when you were saying black and white or was that something negative that she was, that she was helping you? It, it was negative in the terms of my situation. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. Because I, I had no flexibility. Oh, I see. I was very rigid. Oh, and you know, we tend to be, especially like if you have a religious, um, yeah, from a, any type of religious yeah. background, yeah, like religion itself is very staunch, yeah, yeah, it's like this is it, yeah, like, it's very distinctive, yeah, um, which is which can be beneficial if it's laid properly, yeah, you know, if there is perspective behind that, yeah. Um, but for me, in, in my situation, like, yeah. I just wanted answers one, two, three, yeah. like, give me one plus one plus one, yeah. equal three. Yeah. You know, don't make me have to build my, don't make me have to build my, my ones, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not a good, that's not a good illustration, but I just didn't want to consider anything different than my own perspective. Oh, I see. You know, I didn't want to consider another person's perspective. I didn't want to consider other alternative ways of seeing a situation. Okay. I just had a clear black and white, like, I see it this way, so it yeah. must mean this. Yeah. I was willing to step back and see other things, yeah. Um, yeah. consider other components, so. Oh, I see. That's, yeah. That sounds like most of your patients, most of your inpatient patients 
might be going through in the way they were complaining, right? Yeah, and it's just, you know, they've, it's easy to lose perspective when you're in pain. That's true. Like physical pain, emotional pain. Yeah. It's so easy to get caught up in a story in your head that makes so much sense. Yeah. But maybe it's not a complete picture of reality. You have some aspects of it. Yes, it's hard. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You know, those are real things that you're going through, but... Yeah. You know, there are other things that you need to hold on to to mm -hmm. keep your perspective, to keep yourself from melting when the times are... Yeah. When, our, when times are tough and things don't go the way you expected. Yeah. And when you were talking about how there were tons of people that were helping Jamie when she was going through a physical crisis, uh, like Jesus would tell us to go on an extra mile, go on extra, take on extra baggage, something additional, something just beyond your expectation. So all those people modeled you to become that kind of person, and you were you were doing that. You're following your steps. Um, so the last question I have is. I know some Korean physical therapists here that are wanting to go to America because I know that I've heard that physical therapists in the U.S. are paid way better over there and they can run their own clinic and it's almost like a doctor running his own practice. So um, how is it like in terms of the things that I just mentioned? Working like business and financial, yeah. um, but yeah. physical therapists. I mean, we can make it. We make a comfortable living, okay. but we're not ruling in it, you know. Yeah, <laughs> but we're not dirt poor either. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what they make over in Korea. The physical therapists. What's yeah, yeah, the yeah. equivalency? But here, you can make. Um, you can make a comfortable living okay. and yes you can like run your own business and get your own clientele so in america we have something called direct access where patients can directly come to your clinic um without a doctor's referral mm -hmm. but more traditionally speaking most patients are from a doctor's office we get a referral from the doctor oh, okay. like because most patients, people in general, don't think about going to their physical therapist directly. Like, if they have an ache or pain, yeah. they're like, I gotta go to the doctor. They're not thinking, yeah. I gotta go to the physical therapist. <laughs> the only deviation might be, I gotta go to the chiropractor. Okay. But even then, like, usually they'll go to the doctor first. Okay. And, like, physical therapy is definitely not on the radar. So, typically, like, we'll get most of our patients from doctor's referrals. But okay. if you want to set up your own practice, yeah. And be truly independent and get your own patients. Yeah. You just have to be really good about your marketing. Okay. Like putting yourself out there, and you better be a good physical therapist because <laughs> you, know, you are selling yourself. Yeah. You have to like prove to the patient that you are worth coming to directly. Yeah. You know, without like going oh, to your doctor. I see. Um, so you have that component, but you know, even if you want to like go through, you know, doctors like get referrals from doctors, you still need a market, like go to different doctor's offices and present your clinic and like why they should refer patients to you. Um, it's a lot of work. Business ownership is a lot of work. Yeah. Like I work for a private clinic. Okay. I do not want to be in business. <laughs> I do not want to be a business owner. I'm perfectly happy being an employee. Okay. Um, but I look at my boss and see all the, the challenges that he has to go through yeah. running multiple yeah. clinics. Yeah. Um, because if you're running a clinic, you have to remember that you, you're you not solely working for your patients anymore. You have to think about your employees too. Oh. You have to think about the business side. So, which is okay. You know, like if that's, um, you know, if that's your ultimate goal, you prefer the business side, that's fine. Okay. But like that, you know, that, that's some of the, those are the different things on your plate. Oh, I you know, see. They have, um, or I heard this in PT school. There are PTs who are businessmen uh -huh. And then men who are PTs. <laughs> so you can see like where your like natural inclination is. Like if you're a PT who's just, oh, I like do like business, and I'd like to open up a clinic, but you're primarily patient focused. Yeah. You know, like how you shape your clinic is always going to be more directed to that. And you may, um, 
maybe financially you won't be as successful yeah. or you may not be the cutting edge of everything, but you know, you're a PT who's a businessman. Mm -hmm. But if you're a businessman who's a PT, mm -hmm. like PT is just the vehicle for you to create a business, yeah. which is okay, you know, if that's your perspective, but it's just, you know, everyone's going to approach it a little bit differently. Yeah. Wow. And you also said that um, you get a, you get an A when you're studying. How did you get that? What? You get a government financial aid. How did you get that? Oh. <laughs> um, this was for undergrad. Okay. Um, I mean, my family was, my family's poor. Okay. <laughs> so they made a certain amount of money that was, they were in a certain bracket. Oh, I see. That qualified us for, you know, like, that qualified me for financial aid, for good financial aid. Okay. Um, in undergrad. So thank God I finished undergrad with no debt. Oh. Um, in graduate school, like I had to take out loans. You know, financial oh. aid is a little bit different for undergrad versus graduate school. Oh, I see. Um, so I still did get financial aid, but I, I had to pull out a lot of loans. Okay. I and I'm still paying off my loans now. But thank God, like I'm in a career where I can actually, it's actually realistic in my future to be able to pay off my loans. Okay. There's a lot of careers where you pull out a lot of loans and it's not really realistic for you to think about paying it off within the next five to ten years. I heard but from I heard from one dentist that he will have to keep working it in at a like a foreign country or whatever government tells you like assign like assigns you to go to and he will have to work for like ten years to pay off all the student loans. Yeah, they do have some government repayment programs where you work for a county like a low income place and then Yes. After 10 years, you have loan forgiveness. Okay. Well, you're not doing that, right? No, because for one, I didn't want to be locked into that. And <laughs> I felt like I could pay it off faster if I did it on my own. Oh, okay. So, so both reasons. But every, yeah, depending on what your goals are. So even, if, be... so even, if, even if government has a special program for you, there is a way that can that you can uh, accelerate that on your own? Well, yes. <laughs> how, how is it possible? How is... <laughs> well, I mean, if, I, if I'm understanding your question correctly, like if you're in a government program yeah. for 10 years yeah. and then keep paying into it, yeah. and after 10 years, it's forgiven. Yeah. Um, how can, is it possible for me to pay it off like in five years if I do it on my own? Yeah. What you're asking yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Um, depending on how hard I work, how aggressively I pay into <laughs> my loans. Okay. Um, when I first graduated, I was like, you know, set on paying off all my loans as soon as possible. And I still like that, but different. there's been a lot of different life circumstances that have come up okay. since then. Okay. Where I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to funnel all my money into my loans right now because I have other more pressing needs in front of me. Oh, I see. Uh, so I'm not paying into it right now as much as I used to, but I think it's, I mean, it is still possible for me to pay it off like between five and seven years. Okay. So, and like I said, ultimately, I just didn't want to be locked into working for a certain place for like 10 years of my life. <laughs> and that scared me. <laughs> yeah. Because, um, yeah. Yeah. So and I'm happy where I'm at with my with my current job. Like, I guess okay. for for someone that is free spirited like you are, as your sister mentioned, you're independent, and if you're locked up uh, in that contract, you felt you probably could feel like you signed a slave contract. <laughs> yeah, Somehow. so I didn't want that, especially as a new grad coming out of school. You don't want to think about I'm going to be in this job for the next ten years. It's like oh, okay. You know, there's so much more in life that could be happening to you. I don't want my I job see. to be back from them. I see, I see. Wow, thank you, Jandra. I didn't expect this kind of inspirational <laughs> story coming up from your mouth because when I saw you ten, about 10 years ago, you are bubbly, friendly, happy. And I didn't expect you to go through depression and identity crisis and breakdown. And you came out of that through your... Uh, family, help, uh, friends, and you are building a community in the midst of your uh, 
practice with the patient for 40 minutes at a time and I think it's great that you are extending the healing that you have received from somebody else and I'm rooting for you and it's just wonderful that there is such a medical professional that has that heart because I remember uh, receiving any kind of that uh, kind of treatment like that from any medical professional and it was very very inspiring and comforting to know there is a miracle happening on the other side of the globe. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad to be able to share this. Glad we could connect you this. Yeah, yeah. This is my excuse to call people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> wow, thank you, Jandra. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Yeah, thank you for making the time. And thank you for Jamie that is right there. And glad you're... <laughs> I guess it's your brother's turn to be interviewed. <laughs> you call him up, let him know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's been a lot. I, because my, my dad passed away from cancer. I'm sorry. And I went to, and I, whenever I went to the hospital, I didn't like that because people are sick. It's dark. Mm -hmm. Everything is white. Very quiet. People are watching TV. No interaction. Like, like, it was very depressing. And just hearing all these uplifting stories from you uh, means a lot to me. So, because I was very damaged uh, when I first heard that word from the medical doctor that told my mom. My, my dad was unconscious at that moment. He said, he's going to die. Take him home. I can't do anything. And mm -hmm. I felt, I don't know, some kind of like bitterness or some kind of like, like, like disillusion have been building mm -hmm. up against medical industry that, which, that I, as I call. And even though I do appreciate every time I get sick or need treatment, but there was always something that was bothering me in this huge, massive system that didn't seem to be functioning the way it was supposed to end. And, but, um, I think you're, you're, you're correct. You are dealing with mind and you can do a lot and you, mm -hmm. and you help people find a better life. So I'm so thankful that you shared your, 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 your story with me. Thank you for asking. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Giandra. I'll... I'll say bye to you and then bye to Jamie. <laughs> so are we to interview Jen? Yeah. Okay, because I wasn't sure like when like cut like when can oh. we like <laughs> Oh yeah. I was I was about to finish and I was reminiscing about what happened to my dad and I kept talking, so but anyway. Thank you, Deandra.